Hello, a very good morning to all of you. I welcome you warmly this Sunday morning for another CPD program of our webinar series. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our usual housekeeping rules. Uh, the webinar link will be available um, from 9 to 9.50 a.m. for all of you to join in. No late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each attendee should have been attended till the end of the webinar to obtain the certificate for CPD points. And these CPD points are strictly adhered to the NCCPD guidelines. This is done to improve and maintain the standards of the CPD programs we have conducted here at SHRI and GMOA. So we thank you again and again for strictly adhering to these housekeeping rules and for sending us very positive feedback on our webinar series. Um, as usual today, we have with us Dr. Himal to introduce to you a very timely topic today, a topic under respiratory diseases in general practice. So we want to emphasize to you that this is a program done by Sri GMOA Knowledge Academy in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine. Over to you, Dr. Himal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Romal. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining with us in a really difficult time. I hope you can hear me really well. So uh, today we have a very good uh, topic and uh, today our uh, speaker, our resource person is Dr. Muthulingam Adhavan, who is a consultant respiratory physician, currently working in a teaching hospital, Jasna. He's uh, actually uh, he's selected this topic for uh, our interest and we think it's a very timely topic. Uh, he is a product of uh, Jaffa Medical Faculty and compared his postgraduate training in well reputed centers in United Kingdom. Uh, so, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Adhavan to deliver his uh, talk. And uh, we, we have received many questions from you because it's, uh, it's a kind of a very hot topic in general practice. Uh, so, we will be entering the question as much as possible. But if could, we couldn't please let us know. You know our mail, our, our chat group, our chat messages. You can send to us, and uh, we will respond to you soon as we could possible. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Adava, sir, the session is over to you now. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Imal, for the kind introductions. At the outset, I want to thank GMOA and the Student College of Internal Medicine for this opportunity. So my topic today is common respiratory diseases in general practice. So this is going to be the overview of the next day. This is going to be the overview of my talk. So first of all, I will be discussing the symptom analysis, the common respiratory symptoms. And then I will be discussing about the two common pathologies that shouldn't be missed in general practice. But finally, I will be talking about the diagnosis and management of the common structural lung disease encountered in the general practice. So first, um, we will uh, move to the uh, cough, which is the commonest respiratory symptom which is encountered in the general practice. So the cough could be divided into acute cough, subacute cough, and chronic cough. Acute cough, by definition, is usually a cough which is any cough which is lasting less than three weeks is called acute cough. But the acute cough in most cases is due to benign causes. However, it's important to remember some of the patients with acute cough can be harboring, harboring a sinister pathology. So the first step in the evaluation of acute cough is to determine whether this could be potentially due to a sinister pathology. So, so um, the first thing is, uh, so the, the, the common symptoms which potentially indicate a sinister pathology are uh, the presence of hemoptysis, shortness of breath, um, and uh, fever. And in a, in a, especially in a small children, they report an aspiration of the foreign body uh, that might potentially suggest a sinister pathology. And also, if they report a chest pain, so there are constitutional symptoms like weight loss or anorexia that may potentially suggest a sinister pathology. Uh, in the absence of these uh, symptoms, uh, in the absence of these red flag symptoms, majority of the acute cough is either is, is considered the post viral cough, it is either following a common cold or it could be due to an acute bronchitis. 
So when we are looking about, when we are thinking about, an, uh, when we encounter a patient with an acute form, we need to rule out the possibility of a pneumonia pulmonary embolism. So if they report a pneumonia, fluidity type of a chest pain, um, if, they, if, they, if they report a fever or a fluidity type of a chest pain, think about a pneumonia. And if they also report symptoms of DVT, hemoptysis, or fluidity type of a chest pain, uh, think about a pulmonary embolism. And occasionally, congestive heart failure, uh, which often presents it associated with dopnea or fetal edema, uh, can also present with an acute cough. Apart from that, so this is the, uh, the next sir, exacerbation. Sir, excuse me, can I interrupt you once, uh, sir? Yes, your yes. voice is not a bit clear to our audience. That maybe you are talking a bit away from your micro microphone. So if you talk to the bit uh, also, my person that will be really good. Uh, okay, sorry about it. Okay, I'll try to speak loud. Okay. Um, so, so the, another important thing is that we need to think about the possibility of an exacerbation of an underlying structure, structural lung disease. So, the symptoms which potentially suggest an underlying uh, structural lung disease are the patients at the baseline reporting exertional shortness of breath, just to be chronic uh, productive cough. And uh, they may they may also report a frequent symptoms of cough um, with, with diurnal variations. In addition, they may have symptoms of an atopy, in which case you have to think about a possibility of a cough failure and asthma. Um, yes. So this is the, another uh, another. Uh, these are the few other diagnoses that shouldn't be missed uh, when we encounter patients with an active cough. So this is the. This is an algorithm which is developed by the American College of Chest Physicians. So the first, first thing is the history and examinations. On the clinical examination, uh, in addition to the history of the clinical examination, we, look, we need to look for the signs of uh, consolidations or chest infections. And uh, there may be pleural effusions, uh, which might suggest also a little pulmonary embolism. There may be bilateral fine crepes in patients with acute heart failure. Um, and if there could be bees in patients with structural lung disease like asthma or COPD. There may be coarse freckles in patients who have bronchic cases. Once we have reasonably ruled out a life-threatening cause, then we are need to think about a, a non-life-threatening cause, which includes an exacerbation of the pre-existing structural lung disease or upper airway cough syndrome. Then uh, we need to think about the infectious cause. Majority of these are wider. Uh, whether it could be an upper respiratory infection like common cold. The second thing is lower respiratory infections like acute bronchitis. So in Sri Lankan setting, that we need to remember, though the definition of an acute cough is considered less than two, three more, less than three weeks, but in the Sri Lankan settings, any cough which is lasting more than two weeks should be considered a presumptive diagnosis of tuberculosis even in the absence of other systemic symptoms or other respiratory symptoms to suggest a tuberculosis. This is because the TB, TB is a disease with public health consequences. A delay in the diagnosis of the TB can be hazardous not only to the patient himself and as well as to the community. So the early diagnosis of the TB is essential to prevent the transmission chain. So the treatment of, uh, so if you look at the treatment of the um, Common cause, uh, the common causes of acute cause. If you look at the common cold, antibiotics have not been proven to be a beneficial in patients with um, uh, common cold. So though, though we, we may feel to be on the safe side if you prescribe antibiotics, it could be potentially as hard as to the patients because one thing is that we are breaking the antibiotic stewardships. The next thing is uh, it can have a burst to the patient himself. Can cause can lead to antibiotic colitis, can cause allergic reactions, and there are there could be some other side effects. And again, the sedating and non-sedating, so there is no high quality evidence to suggest that these sedating or non-sedating and histamine to be effective in the management of common cold. And then again, uh, the decongestions uh, and intranasal protopians may relieve the block noses nasal congestions. And uh, to some extent, they reduce the rhinorrhea and sneezing. The NSAIDs are frequently prescribed in patients with upper respiratory infections. They are proven to be beneficial in relieving the sore throat and the foam, uh, 
fever and it will improve the well-being. However, it doesn't have much effect uh, in improving the cough. Again, the antihistamine monotherapy is not proven to be beneficial. So these are the list of interventions which are not considered to be beneficial in the management of antibiotics are not beneficial, antihistamine, monotherapy, codeine, not beneficial, international steroids, not beneficial, unless if it has uh, symptoms to suggest an allergic primitis. National irrigations, it may be beneficial in some way that it may relieve the rhinorrhea and block uh, national congestion and it improves the national breathing, but it doesn't um, improve the cough uh, and other symptoms. Vitamin C, yeah, it is, it is proven to be beneficial as a prophylactic therapy in reducing the duration of therapy, but it is not proven. Once the symptoms develop, it is not found to be useful. So the acute bronchitis that we normally call it is an LRDI in our settings. So it is characterized by so so it is characterized by cough with or without sputum production. And most of these patients, the chest X-ray will be completely normal. And majority of the patients, it is due to the viral infections and are due to viral uh, viral infections. The majority of the exacerbation in COPDs are, are due to bacterial infections. Again, steroids. Would be, it would be more beneficial in patients who have um, uh, it would be more beneficial in patients who have raised the osmotic count. Um, however, um, however, um, uh, if you don't have access to the fluid count or a CRP, you can routinely prescribe antibiotics and steroids. So antibiotics in the sense generally, um, so antibiotics in the sense generally, and antibiotics which would cover the pneumococcus, moraxel, and hemophilus influenza. These are the common pathogens which cause the COPD exacerbation. A simple form of cyclic for a cefuroxime would be sufficient. But as you all know, the amoxicillin uh, is no longer sensitive to the pneumococcus, so the use of uh, amoxicillin is unlikely to benefit these patients. Again, the, the next the, the next comments previous slide. Please. The bronchitis is a disease process which is uh, usually uh, the second with the infection and the obstruction. The obstruction could be anatomical or it could be physiological as in clear dyskinesia, which causes permanent distortion and dilation of the bronchus. So this can this make them at increased risk of recurrent uh, chest infections. The common symptoms of uh, bronchitis are uh, chronic productive cough, which could be either uh, uh, they may expectorate a parolent or a non parolent plant, and they may also report hemoptysis, uh, especially if they have a coexisting airway disease like asthma or COPD. So, uh, it is estimated that uh, approximately more than one third of the patients with bronchitis will have either asthma uh, or evidence of airflow limitations suggestive of COPD. So these are the common comorbidities uh, associated with, uh, with bronchitis. And in addition, they may report fatigue, weight loss, there is an extensive bronchitis that can lead to severe anorexia and weight loss. They may also report chest pain, um, um, other, other symptoms, the other uncommon symptoms. So apart from the clinical history of the chronic productive cough and chest infections, um, the sputum uh, microscopic uh, microscopy and pulse sensitivity might give us clue uh, about the possibility of a structural lung disease, especially if they isolate a pseudomonas in a good quality sputum sample. So, surely that is a good choice. Quality sputum sample is suggested by an epithelial cell count less than 50 and a and previous slide. So, and a pus cell count more than 25. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Um, yes, so if there is an isolation of a pseudomonas or unusual pathogen like hemoglobin influenza, think about the possibility of a bronchitis. And the chest x ray uh, is uh, occasionally sufficient to diagnose a bronchitis, but in majority of the cases, for the confirmation of the diagnosis, a high resolution CT scan is needed. So, as I mentioned, so the more than one third of the patient with the bronchitis will have a coexisting other airway disease like asthma or COPD. 
So this is so you know the code is as COP the order you have read about as COP. The same way they can be found in cases can overlap with asthma as well as COPD. So again, um, as I mentioned for the COPD, where there is a long-acting bronchodilators of the cornerstones. Um, and for the bronchi cases, the cornerstone in the management of the bronchi cases is antibiotics. So, um, and it is actually that traditionally they we prescribe a, a rotational antibiotics. So we prescribe if you don't say alternating the forms, let's probably etc. However, now the, the BTS guidelines recommend a pathogen specific uh, antibiotic. So what you need to do is that you need to do a microscopic in culture for the sputum uh, sample for bacterial culture. And based on the uh, uh, pathogen isolation, uh, the antibody should be guided. So, because uh, as you all know that the patients with bronchial diseases are more likely to be colonized uh, with pseudomonas rather than the patient, ordinary patients who are developing an LRTA or pneumonia. So, this is the, most of the conventional antibodies like homocyclavic, kefuroxan, cotrimexazole uh, uh, wouldn't cover pseudomonas. So one of the um, among the oral antibiotics available, only the oral antibody choices are um, that you have uh, you have ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin and the pseudomonas cunolones, which would uh, cover the pseudomonas. And then the more, the, the next important uh, step in the management of uh, bronchial cases is um, the airway clearance techniques. There are various airway clearance methods are used, which includes uh, oscillatory PEP devices, so which is not really available in Sri Lankan uh, settings. Uh, what we normally advise for our patients in our clinic is a bubble PEP therapy, uh, which is a, a very cost effective intervention, which can be done, and, um, uh, which can be, so most of our patients can afford a bubble PEP therapy. So the next thing is regarding the inhalers. Do the patients with the problem cases routinely need a prescription of, uh, of inhalers the answer is no so unless there is no evidence that inhalers are beneficial for patients with bronchial cases uh, as the single pathology however if they have a coexisting uh, copd or an asthma then of course it is they need to be prescribed uh, then again so vaccinations uh, so they need to be vaccinated for pneumococcus uh, for pneumococcal vaccines and then it also needs to be annually vaccinated for influenza so if they are malnourished, if they are cataleptics, then of course they need to be referred to the nutritional therapist or a nutrition uh, uh, doctor uh, to optimize their nutritional status. Uh, then um, if they have exercise limitation because of parenchymal uh, uh, disruption or coexisting airway disease, they need to be referred for pulmonary uh, rehabilitation. So again, the exacerbation is uh, defined as uh, uh, defined as a worsening of the symptoms, which is more than what could be explained by day-to-day -day variation of the symptoms. They, but they often present with an increase in the sputum volume, an increase in the sputum virulence. There are other additional symptoms like dyspnea, chest pain, uh, 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 dyspnea, chest pain, malaise, and fever. So, so I'm not going to talk about the diagnosis of the uh, chronic asthma, which I initially discussed from the assessment of the disease, but you all, all of you know, with the time concern, I'm skip, skipping that. So, as I mentioned, the inhaled corticosteroids are the cornerstone in the management of the asthma. So, um, it is not multilupus, it is not geophilic, it's not oral salbutamol. And in my opinion, the treatment with uh, treatment with oral salbutamol for asthma patients would be considered a crime because um, um, so there is enough evidence from many studies that uh, treatment with beta blockers is cardioprotective and knowing that if you are prescribing beta to agonist as a systemic therapy for patient with an asthma that can be potentially harmful um, so you know about the step management so though the, the uh, 2000 before 2018 the gina was uh, suggesting uh, the short acting beta to agonist, the salbutamol uh, uh, as needed uh, inhaler for patients with mild asthma. That practice is no longer a recommendation. That, that recommendation is obsolete nowadays. This is because uh, what they have found, 
found is the patients who are treated with short acting beta 2 monotherapy, beta 2 agonist monotherapy, are at increased risk of developing. They are at 60% more risk of developing an exercise patient rather than people who are treated with a combination ICS and short acting beta 2 agonist. So, therefore, even in a mild asthmatics, we have very infrequent symptoms, but you need to prescribe this, a combination of inhaled corticosteroids and short acting uh, beta 2 agonist. Um, inhaler. So it is ideal, it is preferable if you prescribe with a single inhaler because uh, even if you advise a patient that you need to take the preventer as well as the reliever, patient may feel that their relief, the preventer is not working because it's not providing them immediate relief. So they tend to omit using the preventer even if you, if you prescribe that by a uh, different inhaler. Therefore, it is preferable if you prescribe both ICS and short acting beta 2 agonist on a single inhaler. All of your patients needs to be managed on the, uh, advised on the self-management of the, what they do, they, uh, what they should do, they develop worsening symptoms of, when they should come to meet you. Because otherwise the patients can end up with life-threatening for a, a severe asthma in the AME and they can. So some of the patients can die before hospital admission. So you need to advise the patients when to seek medical help. So ideally, the peak exploratory flow rate measurement is used very, very valuable in guiding the patients on the self management. Unfortunately, it's not freely available uh, in Sri Lanka, so therefore, uh, it should be advised based on their symptoms. So, so what are the aims of the treatment of asthma? So, so the, the main aims are that to make them less symptom free, so to improve the quality of life. So the prevention of the lung function decline. So, so what? It, so many of my patients, uh, they what they do is that they use the inhalers as needed because only if they if it affects their quality of life, they take inhalers because they are being unaware about the impact of the uncontrolled asthma on the lung function is decline. So these those patients need to be educated why they need to go for a step down or, uh, approach. And why they need to be compliant with the inhaler therapy. Otherwise, majority of the patient will be taking the inhalers only when they are symptomatic. So the, the third thing is uh, the prevention of the exacerbations. So if there's so though their symptoms is not affecting the quality of life, they may be having a low grade symptoms which they disregard. Uh, so in which case their asthma uh, is uh, partially controlled or uncontrolled. They can end up with CPA and the life threatening exacerbation. So these patients need to be warned again. Like all this, all the patient needs to be advised again the potential harm of keeping the asthma uncontrolled. So, so these are the three important things that you need to check, check in each uh, each patient coming to your clinics. So first thing is with, check whether the asthma is well controlled or uncontrolled. Um, so to check whether the asthma is well controlled, there are three questions that I normally ask. What is your daytime symptom frequency? If there's daytime symptom, there daytime symptom frequency less than twice a week, then it could be considered uh, negative. And if they're nocturnal awakening due to asthma symptoms, it is less than twice a month, then it is negative. And if they don't have activity limitation, if all these three are negative, then you can assume the asthma is uh, well controlled. So there are other additional things. If they have a completely normal lung function, and that again suggests them well controlled asthma. So they're partially controlled asthma if they have one or more of these symptoms being positive, and if it's uncontrolled, if they have two or more of these symptoms being positive. And always ask uh, uh, about their compliance in a non-blaming manner. So what I normally ask is, what is the chance of you forgetting the inhalers in a week? So then of course that they will come out with the truth. Uh, so, why I highlight only these three interventions, uh, there are several other interventions which I didn't have, but these are the most important things. Ninth, so if you if you have done all these three, check the compliance, check the inhaler techniques, check whether the asthma is well controlled, and if all these three interventions are done, you can uh, keep control the 97 percentage of the asthma with step three and below. And, and remember, and if the asthma remains, don't hesitate. The, re the asthma remains uncontrolled despite uh, the inhaler, despite uh, despite being compliant. 
uh, inhaler therapy and with good inhaler technique, uh, never hesitate to uh, step up. And in the same time, remember that you need to step down if the asthma remains well controlled for a period of three to six months, then you need to step down because uh, the, even though the inhaled corticosteroids uh, don't have much side effect, in vulnerable people, it can, especially in the elderly, it can lead to osteoporosis, diabetes, and other side effects. Therefore, you need to step down when it is not needed. So, again, exacerbations, if they have worsening symptoms, it's more than what is explained by the neutral variation, then it needs to be assessed. Uh, assessed. So, you could have advised the patient on the self management of the asthma. They have a peak flow, and if they are monitoring the peak flow, if the peak exploratory flow rate is more than uh, 70% of the predicted, uh, then of course they can continue with their usual treatment. But if it is less than 70%, but if it is more than 50, but less than 70, you can ask the patient to part of the use of inhaled corticosteroids. For example, if the patient is on uh, on on a uh, ICS format roll combination, for example. Butyrosinic format or combination is only ICS format or combination which is available in Sri Lanka. So, you, if they are on a lower dose, like say um, 400 microgram, one pump twice a day, you can ask them to part trouble because the maximum safe dose of format or is 72, maxi, uh, uh, 72 macrogram, and each pump of um, butyrosinic format or contains six microgram. They can after have a 12 pump. If the usual dose is one pump twice daily, one puff twice daily, they can use the same inhalers to control it. So this can abort an asthma attack, focusing it severe or a life attack. So then again, about the antibiotics. So the, my common observation that antibiotics are again overused in the management of asthma. As I mentioned before, the majority of majority of the asthma situations are due to viral infection. So antibiotics are not needed in the asthma situations unless you have a strong suspicion of a bacterial infection. There is an evidence of a consolidation of the chest x ray. If they have fever, uh, they have raised inflammatory markers, then only you need to prescribe antibiotics. And we need to avoid the overuse of antibiotics in these settings. And the systemic steroids, if they have, if their peak flow goes below 50%, then they need a prescription of the systemic steroids. The dose in an adult is still only 40, 40 milligrams, which can be given for a duration of 5 to 4. Um, then you have to make a decision whether these patients need a hospital admission. If the patient doesn't improve, the peak flow doesn't improve, the clinical symptom doesn't improve despite nebulizations or treatment with short acting beta organics and steroids within a few hours, then of course, then of course you can make a decision on the hospital admission. So, yeah, so that brings the end of my talk. So, uh, uh, Himal, do you want to discuss about answers for the pre-evaluation MCQs, or do you want to? So I know I know that I have far exceeded my time. Himal, uh, yes, sir. Thank you for your excellent talk regarding the studies in general practice, uh, sir. Since we don't have much time, shall we go to the questions already asked from the audience? Okay, the best thing we can do here. And we can publish the results, I mean, the answers for the, your questions uh, okay. on the uh, post assessment. Right. So, uh, shall we start the questions Q and A in that case? Okay. Okay. So, uh, first question is uh, what is the definition of chronic cough? So, any cough which is uh, lasting more than eight weeks is called a chronic cough. Right. So this is a definition which is uh, set by the American Association of the Family Physician. That any cough which is lasting more than eight weeks is called chronic cough. Uh, without any, the second question, without any investigation uh, for the chronic cough, what are the medication we can give to suppress it in the general practice? So the treatment of the chronic cough is the treatment of the cause of the chronic cough. Uh, so the, the most important thing you have to remember is that uh, so majority of the chronic cough usually has a cause. So that's, as I mentioned, so once you have ruled out the, the sinister pathologies like uh, lung cancers and TB, and uh, then of course you have to think about the structural lung disease. Of course you can perform a chest x-ray which can 
show evidence of the bronchic disease, then in which case you have to perform a high resolution CT. But if you suspect a COPD, you can you have to perform a spirometry to exclude. If you suspect an asthma, the spirometry can be uh, can be abnormal if there is airflow limitations. But in a covariant asthma, it could be new, uh, normal. In which case, you can either go for an inhaled corticosteroids or thylosystemic steroids. If the cough doesn't improve with the thylosystemic steroids, so inhaled corticosteroids can be used for a one month, then this makes the diagnosis of asthma less likely. So uh, there are other possibilities like non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis, which uh, very well responds to the thylosystemic steroids. Then you have to treat for the cause of the GORB. So, so in our chronic cough clinic, what we normally do is we refer these patients uh, who don't have a clear explanation. We uh, refer these patients to the gastroenterologist to get the 24 hour pH studies and the esophageal manometry done, and they undergo upper GI endoscopies. And these patients are being frequently assessed by the uh, ENT specialist to, for, to, to look for upper airway cough syndrome. So, if they say there is, there is, and they undergo sinus CTs and assessment by the ENT surgeons. And if there is a strong suspicion, and then we advise on intranasal steroids, nasal touching, that you can have a, you can uh, Google and find through the uh, YouTube nasal touching how it should be performed. So these, so these causes needs to be considered before you make diagnosis of idiopathic cough. So idiopathic cough, so th this kind of an exhaustive evaluation needs to be done before you conclude that this could be a potential idiopathic cough. It is also called a chronic cough hypersensitivity. So there are several medications where there are, there are some newly diagnosed, there are newly invented medications which are not available to us. So, um, which are used in the chronic cough hypersensitivity. But that should only be prescribed after an exhaustive evaluation. And I would recommend uh, these patients should be referred to a respiratory specialist to make the decision on. So, what I normally do in the whole clinic is we prescribe the garbalin, carbapentin, and morphine. My experience with morphine is quite good for chronic cough hypersensitivity. Majority of the patients on the visual analog score like scale, it may, they may be reporting 8 to 10 uh, before being commenced on the morphine. But uh, once they are commenced um, uh, uh, on the morphine, they report 0 or 1, many patients. So, so, uh, so, but unfortunately, the morphine is again not available in the private sector. It's only available in the state sector. So this patient needs to be referred to that. The specialist. Kemal? Uh, second question, uh, third question, sir. Uh, the place for theophilines to manage the management of cough and the chronic cough. I think we have discussed here bronchial asthma as well. Yes, so theophylline is a, um, is a bronchodilators. It is mentioned to have some modest bronchodilatory effect. But there is no evidence from the RCTs that it has suppressed the cough. And then again, for the asthma management, the GINA advise against the use of the theophylline for the management of asthma. And the gold recommend against the use of theophylline for the management of it. Because it's a drug with a narrow therapeutic index. So, the, so, so there is a potential. So, a risk of a toxicity, especially if you are combining it with an acetromycin, which is an enzyme inhibiting drug. And there is a, so, um, it is a drug with a modest benefit. I don't normally prescribe theophylline in my practice for any of the patients with that good problem. So I limit, so un unfortunately we don't have level monitoring either. So in such instances, I never prescribe theophylline in my practice. Right, uh, how do you differentiate uh, a bacterial infection from a viral infection while we treat it for upper tract infection? Uh, Hima, can you repeat the question again? Uh, can you hear me now, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. How you differentiate a bacterial infection from a viral infection while you treating for an upper respiratory infection? So, as I mentioned before, the majority of the uh, upper respiratory infections are viral. So, except the patients with chronic rhinosinusitis, where they can pro uh, progress into acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. So, so, so you shouldn't think about a bacterial rhinosinusitis if they are if the symptoms are less than seven seven days. So you need to suspect a secondary bacterial infection. If they say the symptoms get improved, but after all of a sudden it get worse. And if they have an anterior parotid nasal discharge and so which which means that they blow out 
parole and resuscitation. They report facial pains. If they have fever and if they throat clear, parole and nasal discharge, then of course you need to suspect that bacterial, good bacterial rhinos and sinusitis. Um, the CRP might give you a clue, especially if the CRP is completely less than less than 20, it is very suggestive of the viral infection. Uh, next question is, uh, what are the basic investigation we need to order and what are the essential we need to order if a patient comes with a respiratory infection? So I repeat it again, sir. What are the basic investigation we should do if a patient comes with the upper risk effect uh, to the OPD, outpatient clinic? So, yeah, that's the thing. So, not everybody need evaluation or investigations unless they have reflex symptoms. As I mentioned, if an acute cough, the cough is lasting less than three weeks and they have runny nose or sore throat. In the absence of a fever, in the absence of a shortness of the absence of a hemoptysis or a history of a foreign body aspiration uh, or a institutional symptom like chest pain, or if they are not feeling ill, not tachycardic, not tachypnic, then in which case they not doesn't necessarily need uh, 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 any prescription of antibiotics for and they don't need any investigation. They could be reassured. They could be used honey and lemon for the relief of the cough. They could be prescribed. They have sore throat. They could be prescribed some NS sites which could relieve their fever as well as uh, sore throat. And then they could be advised like, for the nasal uh, irrigation with normal saline and then some nasal deconditions um, and then ectotropiums, uh, nasal sprays could be used in these patients. So, not all the patients, uh, the majority of the patients with upper respiratory symptoms doesn't need any infection unless they have these red flag symptoms. Uh, what are the instances we should use antibiotics as a prophylactically in a viral infection, viral upper respiratory infection? So, yeah, most of the uh, viral infections doesn't turn into uh, uh, turn into a bacterial infection. Uh, so, however, some can turn into a secretarial infection. I don't think that we need to prescribe and there is no evidence to uh, form the, uh, there is no evidence that I come across that this, uh, this prophylactic antibiotics needs to be prescribed. I think it should be avoided uh, uh, in the best interest of the antibiotics to urge him. Uh, so, we have come across a lot of post COVID complications now to the pandemic. Pardon? Uh, we have come across a lot of post-COVID complications of the pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, how we manage uh, the chronic long-standing upper respiratory uh, symptoms due to COVID-19 infection, past COVID-19 infection? Of course, if you think it is a long-standing upper respiratory symptom, then of course those patients need to be referred to an ENT specialist. So this could be a symptom of a chronic uh, rhinosinusitis. Then they need to have a look and see that it could be due to polyps or something like that. So if they, need, they may need a nasal endoscopy. They may need a CT sinuses. So if they have a long-standing non-improving symptoms, they need to be referred to the uh, ENT specialist. However, if, they, if you think this could be an allergic rhinitis, you may try with the intranasal steroids, especially if they have other symptoms of HOP and if they have uh, sneezing, and rhino of the as the predominant symptoms are the anti uh, facial pain, or if they don't have any red flag symptoms, then of course you can try with an intranasal steroids. If you strongly think this could be a chronic rhinosinus scientist, which is not resolved with the intervention like anti standing or intranasal steroids, then it is preferable those patients to be referred to the ENT specialist. Uh, what are the screening tests we can use to exclude the pulmonary tuberculosis in general practice? That's what I say. So the chest structure is the most important, sense, uh, the most sensitive investigation. So it is uh, abnormally 95% of the patients with pulmonary TB, but it could be normally uh, 5%. So if you can confidently interpret the chest X-ray, a completely normal chest X-ray would exclude the diagnosis of uh, uh, pulmonary T, uh, reasonably excluded diagnosis of pulmonary TB. But if you have a strong suspicion of a TB, Especially if they have a significant systemic symptoms like fever, weight loss, and anoxia, then of course you can perform a high resolution CT. Sputum smears uh, uh, would be helpful, like sputum smears for AFDs, gene experts. And if you refer the patient to the chest clinic, so they can, they can, it can be done free of charge. Uh, if uh, typical imaging findings are compatible with the TB, uh, but 
the symptoms are negative and there is no signs of uh, any fever or chronic cough will you consider it as active tb so the yeah, so that yeah so that there is a higher so the confidence of the diagnosis of making a microbiological diagnosis of tb will be extremely higher than a clinical diagnosis so if the imaging is characteristics and if the symptoms are compatible so it's a so we make a decision on treating as per a clinical uh, diagnosis pulmonary uh, tb um, so after as uh, after uh, reasonably excluding the other possibilities so if we know that this is not explained by the bronchial disease or pneumonia or anything else then of course we treat it as per a clinical diagnosis but that decision needs to be made by a respiratory specialist uh, hope i have answered the question kimar yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the next one is regarding steam inhalation and the upper respiratory infection. Uh, uh, steam inhalation and upper respiratory infection. Uh, is it the best pharmacological methods? What are the evidence favor for steam inhalation for upper respiratory infection? And what is your experience? So, yeah. So this is again. Uh, there are some of the unproven intervention I have mentioned in my slides. So again, this is steam inhalation. There is no RCT evidence that it would be beneficial. So the systemic systematic analysis of the uh, meta-analysis of, of, of several RCTs have shown that steam inhalation is not more than just observations. It may have a placebo effect, but it is not superior to to, to uh, any other interventions. Right, uh, sir. So steroid use in a respiratory disease in general practice. Uh, any benefit to harm using dexamethasone uh, for treating for upper respiratory infection in general practice? Again, so if you have cough which is getting prolonged, for example, if you have a cough which is going beyond two weeks, um, so the, one of the possibility which is causing a prolonged cough in these patients is that they may be, so the asthma is a common diagnosis, it's a common entity. So the people, so majority of the patients, the cough usually settles within a week. But if it is getting prolonged, some of these patients, they may be having a mild asthma. They have a tendency for asthma. Their symptoms may be getting prolonged. In those patients, they may benefit from uh, dexamethasone. But of course, uh, we need to remember if they are getting a frequent symptoms of that, we need to properly treat that patient as for an asthma, rather than treating with the systemic steroid, which could be, uh, which can there are systemic side effects of the TB. Uh, the systemic side of the steroids, long term systemic side effects of the steroid is not acceptable. And again, so in anybody who is having a cough more than two weeks, you need to check the performance chest x ray uh, to exclude the TB before you prescribe the systemic steroids. Right. Uh, the next question is uh, if you suspect a lung cancer, what is the best imaging model to do? Uh, exclude the lung cancer. Yeah, that's what I say. This X-ray um, is it's not very sensitive. It is reasonably sensitive, but it, it could be negative in one fifth of the patient with the lung cancer. So what they say is 80 to 90 percent of the lung cancer could be picked up on X-ray, but uh, the, the 15 percentage, approximately 15 percentage, could be missed on the X-ray. So in such cases, if you have a high index of suspicion, then you need to refer them. So there are a few instances that I missed uh, the diagnosis of lung cancer on the first presentation because the chest x-ray is normal. But sub subsequently, since I followed the patient, I, I was able to pick them, uh, pick them back because they have persistent symptoms which is not responding to the treatment which they have given. So, so then I decided to proceed with the CT and then I diagnosed the lung cancer. Uh, next question, sir. How to diagnose the obesity hyperventilation syndrome? Or Pickwickian syndrome in a obese. So yeah, so it's a obesity hyperventilation. Uh, it's, so I think it is beyond the scope of this discussion. Yes. So obesity hyperventilation syndrome uh, uh, is is diagnosed is a diagnosis of an exclusion. So in anybody who is having a PCO2 more than forty five without with in a patient who is morbidly obese, that is BMI more than thirty and above. Then it should be suspected after uh, excluding all of the possibilities which can cause a raised PCO2. So that is the daytime PCO2. So some patients uh, they may not have uh, evidence of um, 
raised PCO2 on the uh, ABG, which is performed in the array. But in such instances, overnight oximetry studies, which can show uh, 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 oxygen saturation, which is pinned uh, below 90% or more than 90% of the study duration, would suggest uh, an obesity hyperventilation. But that is not a specific test, but that suggests the possibility of an obesity hyperventilation. So ideally, a sleep related hyperventilation could be diagnosed by transcutaneous carbon dioxide monitoring. But of course, there are some in some patients, it is a combination of the things. They may be smokers as well, and they may be having an undiagnosed COPD, and which is contributing in addition to the obesity. So, again, that 90% uh, of the obesity patients with uh, obesity hyperventilation also have OSA, or absence of uh, an OSA. Um, uh, on the sleep study, make it less likely. Uh, for the control of asthma, as an initiation of therapy, what is the best treatment of choice out of these? Is it whether it's a combination with uh, LABA and inhaled corticosteroid or uh, inhaled corticosteroid alone? So it depends on the steps. So I can mention that I didn't spend much time on that. It depends on how frequent they have the daytime symptoms. Depends on how frequent they have nocturnal awakening and how bad the lung function. So, in somebody who have a daily symptoms, um, uh, frequent nocturnal awakening, who have activity limitations, in which patients I would start with the step three, which is low dose ICS plus LABA. So, if they have a very infrequent symptoms, then of course I would use a single single inhaler ICS LABA, uh, LABA therapy as an as needed inhaler. So, they like what I normally use is butyrosinate format or combination. As an as needed in patients who have very infrequent symptoms, who have a reasonably more frequent symptoms, then of course uh, I would consider a low dose ICS as a regular therapy plan as needed uh, ICS uh, SABA inhaler on top of that. Uh, last question, sir. The audience are asking regarding the guideline recommendation to manage uh, common respiratory disease in Sri Lanka. Do we have a, a guideline in Sri Lanka or any other reference? So we have TB guidelines. Uh, so na the national program for tuberculosis uh, control and chest disease have TB guidelines, and then we have the guidelines for asthma. I think that you can uh, Sri Lankan College of Pulmonology website you can come across. I think COPD guidelines are on that me. Uh, so yes. Uh, so we have come to the uh, the end of the session. Actually, uh, I need to thank you for your. Uh, contribution and the time, valuable time uh, for this session, sir. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. And we'll be expecting you from future sessions as well. And uh, let me thank our um, partnership with the uh, Sri Lankan College of Internal Medicine to make these sessions very successful. And let me thank uh, its president, uh, Dr. Danaka Senaratna, and the coordinator for this session, Dr. Nandini Nyanapakas. And uh, uh, last of the least, I would uh, like to thank you all for joining us with this, this difficult time with a lot of uh, shortcomings with us throughout the session. Uh, so, uh, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Romali. Imal, come to the session now. Thank you. Thanks, Imal, for the uh, opportunity. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining with us again. We hope to see you again next uh, weekend with another webinar of our webinar series. We apologize for all the technical difficulties today and we will try to improve our Zoom webinar platform further with your input. Thank you all and have a great week. Occasionally, very occasionally, this could be due to